Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, come on by and join us at 5383 Martin Street. That's in Harupa Valley. And if you become a part of the group that's here, like this morning, every Friday, well, not every Friday, but most Fridays, our brother Manny, resident chief chef, uh, cooks up a storm and breakfast, and we all get to eat together and fellowship. So it's a blessing uh, to do so. So I know that uh, I've been gone the last week from our Devo, so I don't expect too many people to be watching right now because it's a surprise. But hopefully if you're watching, uh, welcome, and I hope that you'll join us at 9, at 9 a.m. in the morning. Today we are starting a new book. It will be in First Thessalonians. So you might want to grab your Bible, a highlighter, your cup of coffee, and sit down and, and enjoy God's Word with us. So why was I gone? Well, I was at a pastor's conference, the Calvary Chapel Association Conference, which was held in Diamond Bar, hosted by Raul Reese in his church. And it was a great turnout. It was some great messages. The Lord blessed, anointed, great fellowship, got to see some old friends got to make new friends. Uh, it was really, really encouraging. I, uh, myself, Randy and Manny uh, were down there. It is a pastor's conference and leadership. Uh, we went together and we were fed spiritually. Uh, we hung around Justin Alfred and got to meet a few other pastors. A good friend of mine, uh, uh, Zamora, was there, David Zamora, got to hang around him, had lots of food, tacos, uh, far-reaching ministry uh, put on lunch on Saturday. Uh, they had wild boar, venison, and I believe, uh, I think buffalo of some sort, some other wild animal, and they, and they, gr they grinded it all up into hamburger meat. So it, it was good, you didn't know what you were eating, in other words, but it was good, it was really good. So we had a good time there, and a lot of food, and, they, and the best part, and I keep telling Manny this, they had an ice cream truck there. And they had those old fashioned Tasty Freeze ice creams, you know, the vanilla, and then they would chocolate dip it, you know? And so I remember as a little kid um, going and buying those little vanilla chocolate tips, and these things were like this long. So I think the, the first day we were there, I had me two of them right away. I had I, three days and I had, uh, what, four or five ice creams. <laughs> Free in and out burgers. <laughs> oh, and free in and out burgers too. But the ice creams were the best. And this guy actually, he he uh, he turned me on to some cherry dip. And I said, "What's that?" I thought it was like a jelly of some sort. He goes, "No, that's actually chocolate, but it's cherry." So he says, "I'll tell you what. I'll make you a special." So he dipped it in chocolate, and then he dipped the tip in cherry. So it came out looked like man, you said like a volcano, you know. But oh, it was so good. And of course, it drips all over your hand because. It was probably 100 degrees out there in, in, in the parking lot, but we had a great time, so great time fellowship and so forth. So that's why I was gone. So hopefully you guys will all, all come back. Let's pray, and we'll get into God's Word. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. You are you're so good, Father. Oh, Lord, how can we ever doubt your goodness, Father? Lord, I know, I, I know that we're human, and I know that we, we sometimes run uh, not on gas, but diesel fuel, uh, Lord, and it messes us up, Lord, when we're running by our flesh. Yes, there's trials. Yes, there's struggles. Yeah, there's tribulation. Yeah, there's family battles. Um, oh, Lord, financial difficulties, Lord God, uh, illnesses, chronic pain. I get all that, Father. We live in a fallen world, and we are in a battle and because of sin, Lord, these things happen. Yes. But Lord, you said something very clearly to your disciples. You know, in this world, you will, you will have tribulation. You will have hardships. You will struggle. Yes. But he said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And what did he mean by that? What he meant was, our place is not here. This is temporal. We're passing through. And our home is in heaven you, for eternity. And that's overcoming this world, Lord, that you have given us victory through your resurrection, that we have a home in heaven, a mansion waiting for us. And when we're all done here and we've persevered through the pains and the sufferings, through the trials and the struggles, and as we have put our faith 
and our trust in you, Lord, we will live eternally in heaven. And Lord, I, I like the fact that once in a while you, you make that real to us because you allow us to go through something painful. And then when we come to the end of that pain and we finally are healed and we feel better, we're 100%, we're able to resume our life and our activities, also we realize, wow, that seemed like a short time of pain. Yet when we were going through it, it seemed so difficult and so hard, but yet we look back and we go, wow, that wasn't that bad. And that's, I believe, how it will be when we get to heaven. We're going to look back and say, you know what? That wasn't as bad as I thought. And now that we're in heaven, it is cruising on easy street for the rest of our existence Amen. with God Almighty, which is forever and ever, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for being the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Thank you for your love. Thank you for spoiling us, Lord, and just pouring your grace and love and mercies on us, Father. Now we pray that you would minister to us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so grab your Bibles, everyone. Good morning, uh, Diana. Glad you're, you're with us. Good morning, Moses. Glad you're with us all the way from, from India watching. And anyone else that is watching and doesn't want me to know you're there, welcome. <laughs> so we are in 1 Thessalonians, uh, <coughs> which is page 1217 in my Bible, the Nelson Open Bible. Paul, the apostle, is the author of two letters that we find in the New Testament that were written to the Thessalonians. Now, one letter is enough. I don't know about you, but I have never written a letter to anybody except my wife. And it was very short. And it was when I was in high school and I was in love with her. Not that I'm not in love with her now, but I was in love with her. And it was all, oh, I love you. I love the color of your hair. I love your green eyes, you know, and it was like, what else can I say, you know, uh, and that was probably the only letter I, I have ever written to anybody, I've never written a letter to anyone, has anyone ever written a letter to anyone? Yeah, yeah. so there's some old timers here that have written letters, <laughs> of course today, now we, we do what, we email or we text somebody, you know, or, or so forth, but one letter is, is, is hard enough, but what an accomplishment if you've written one letter, but two? That means you're really important if you receive two letters, right? So Paul loved the Thessalonians greatly as he writes these letters. And of course, these letters are written. We have to change our mindset because sometimes we look at the Bible and we view it from the point of chastisement. Like, like God is just beating us up. And, and yes, there is chastisement. There's correction. But this correction and chastisement comes from what? Love comes from love. God loves us enough to say, look, what you're doing is, is going to cause you a lot of trouble and pain down the future. And so don't do it. You have a choice. You can do it, but I'm just warning you. I'm not going to force you. Don't do it because you're going to suffer from it. You'll have some consequences. We all know that, right? Yeah. We've all done things and we realize, okay, that's my fault, Lord. Not yours, not anyone else's. I made the choice and now I have to live with the consequences. So Paul's writing to them out of love and compassion and concern. He's really encouraging the Thessalonians here. The first letter here, 1 Thessalonians, was written to a community of believers who had been Christians for only a short period of time, probably no more than a few months. So you can imagine, if you remember, when you were saved, how exciting those first few months were, right? You have come to Jesus Christ, he saved you, you have eternal life, you're gonna head home. I know that when I got saved, I thought, oh wow, I'm never gonna sin again. I'm never gonna struggle again. Life is gonna be so good for me. And boy, was I wrong. You know, I was totally wrong, but that's how I thought because I didn't know doctrine. I didn't read the Bible all the way through. I didn't understand that there was suffering and persecution coming. I just was so excited about the fact that God would save a wretch like me. And so probably the Thessalonians were kind of like this. This is exciting. You know, God is so good. And, and every doctrine that Paul taught, they were like, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. And, yeah, yeah. and when Paul came to the doctrine of Jesus' return, they were like, yeah, we're waiting for that, you know. And so this is the excitement that was in the church. And we learned from the book of Acts that during Paul's stay there in the city of Thessalonica, he preached in a Jewish synagogue three consecutive Sabbath days, and he eventually stayed in the city for some time thereafter and continued his work among the Gentiles, and they were Gentiles, non-Jewish uh, believers. 
And although his ministry was successful to the extent that he won converts to Christianity from both Jews and Gentiles, he did encounter opposition, especially from Jews, who resented very much that he was able to win Jewish followers over to Christ. And of course, the Judaizers. These were the religious people. Uh, these were the people that did not like the liberties that we had in Christ Jesus. And these are the religious people that are still here, still here today that, that judge us, you know, instead of uh, praying for us. They'll look at us and they'll judge us by our actions and our works. Look, the Bible says that we're all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. Are we perfect? No, no way are we ever perfect. And so we need to just stop judging each other on those non-essentials. You know, well, that guy's personality is wrong. So what? That's your problem. You know, that's who he is. That's who God made him. And maybe his personality is rubbing you the wrong way because God's trying to change your personality because you've got an issue with certain things. And we need, we need to be able to see those things. Lord, how can you use that person to change me? How can you use that person to help me grow in my faith? I'm not talking about doctrine because if someone comes into this church and they start preaching that they're Jesus Christ in the flesh and that you all need to believe in them, I'm going to kick them out as fast as I can. Amen. You'll see me move faster than Flash Gordon. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean that I won't tolerate, you know, but personalities and, and, and communication and relationships, those are things that we all have to learn. I can't come in and save you from all that, right? Because you have to learn through those issues. Otherwise, you'll never learn those lessons. So these religious leaders didn't like that Paul was saving Jews. And so they were upset and bringing opposition uh, against him. And so the main purpose, though, of Paul's letter is to deal with the special problem that developed after Paul left the city. And he left the city because of these Judaizers. He didn't want the opposition to, to really become intense in these new believers. So he tried to calm things down a little bit. Uh, Paul shared with the Christians at Thessalonica his belief that the, at the end of the ages uh, would come uh, in the near, near future. In other words, the world was coming to an end. Jesus was coming back for the church, and his second coming would, would soon take place. And that's how Paul believed. He's coming now, but he may come later. He believed, in the, he believed that the Lord could return any moment, but he lived as though the Lord, Lord would not return for many years from now. But he really thought the Lord was returning, and he Pour that into the Thessalonians, and they thought that the Lord was returning also. And when the first Christian accepted that idea that the that the man who had died on the cross, who was the real Messiah, would would they would they were convinced that he must return to earth. While they were still there, um, they began to doubt when they didn't return. And when many of them passed away, and the next generation rose up, they began to doubt and say he's never returning. And so Paul is dealing with that doctrine of Christ's return. Uh, they struggled because they saw that he didn't return, so then they began to question other things, right? And usually we do that, don't we? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a person that thinks a lot. I think about everything. And I, don't, I wish I had a key back here that can just turn it off, but I don't. And I'm thinking about every little thing, and sometimes I'm trying to think of the intent. Why would they do that? Why would they say that? I don't understand. Maybe it's, maybe this is the reason. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe I said this. Maybe I, you know. And I'm trying to figure everything out. And I need to just turn that off because I won't. And it's just spinning my wheels and it's causing me to fu be frustrated. We need to just trust in God. So this is how the Thessalonians should have reacted. And Paul's going to encourage them. It's just trust in the Lord. He's going to return, but he's going to return on his timing, not our timing. We can't determine that. We can't force that. We have to trust that God knows what is best for us. He knows what is best for the world because we're not the only ones in this world. And so we need to trust in him and not believe that maybe he forgot us. Maybe he doesn't care about us. And so maybe this then promise over here can't be true. And we start doing that, don't we? Well, then if he doesn't do that, then that means he doesn't love me. He doesn't want me. He doesn't care about me. And so now we start doubting his love for us. And we start doubting his care for us. And then maybe he, he, maybe I'm not even his child. That's probably why. Now we're doubting that we're even saved. And that's what it happens. It just leads and leads and leads and leads. Which is a lie of the enemy. He comes in and he robs and steals us. So when you begin to doubt, stop right there. Just tell you, no, I'm not going that way. Look at the cross. Jesus didn't do all that for nothing. 
He didn't do all that for nothing. He did it for a reason. And he made it very clear. Paul made it very clear that he who begun a good work in you is faithful to complete it. Good work means good work. God's working in you and through you to do good things among the world. And those good things are not what you think are good. That's what God thinks are good. And they could be as simple as, you know, blessing a brother and you've changed them completely. That's the purpose that you're here for. So be encouraged as, as we go through this uh, little epistle here. And today we are going to read 10 verses, and that's why it took 15 minutes to talk about the introduction. Because <laughs> I knew that it was a short chapter. All right, so let's start in verse 1. And by the way, if you are watching, you can have a watch party, uh, something new on Facebook, and you can share it with your friends at this moment. Or you can do a watch party later on. So verse 1, chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, if you have a Bible. And it's good that you follow along with a Bible or a Bible app on your phone so that you see what I'm saying is biblical, and I'm just going with the text. So Paul, uh, Salvanus, and Timothy. Now, these were three friends three co-laborers in the gospel that Paul had picked up along his way in his mission journeys that had become tightly knitted together. Now the word tightly knitted together, when, when Paul talks about that being knitted together, that's the word that you, you, you um, use to talk about knitting. Patty would understand this. You take wool and you put it into a machine. I don't know what the machine is called. And, and you run it in one way and you bring this tool down that that pushes it down and then you run the thread in another way and it pushes it down and it just keeps pushing and you're tightly knitting it until you come with, with a blanket. What's that called? That's a weaving loom. A weaver. 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 Weaving loom. Weaving loom. Weaving loom. Get it from Patty. She knows this one. <laughs> <laughs> so so this is this is how tightly knitted they were together. You know, this is what God wants, by the way, and this is how ministry is run and functions and how ministry grows, is when we stop overthinking things and just say, hey, we're all in this together, we're going to work together, and we're going to change this world together. And Paul, Salvinus, and Timothy uh, did. It says, to the church in Thessalonica, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is written to the Thessalonians. And by the way, this is a church that are gathering together. Uh, in a building, fellowshipping with one another. And so, again, we should be in church once a week on Sunday morning in a building, fellowshipping with one another. And Paul is writing to not just them, but to the church that is there. And, of course, he, he pronounces blessings on them, grace, you know, and peace. And it comes only from the Father and God in heaven. And, by the way, when you pronounce blessings or when you pray... What are you praying from? You know, are you praying from the Father in heaven, Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit? Someone that's tangible, that has matter, that does change things, that is real and does exist? Or are you just praying to have sending good vibes? You ever hear someone say, I'm going to send good vibes. What does that mean? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. I'm going to send prayers to you from nobody. So how is nobody going to help me if you're going to send prayers? <clears throat> I'm just going to say positive thoughts. Mm, positive thoughts. How is that going to help me? It's nothing. And now we think it's something because it's positive and you've got to think positive and, and so forth. I get that. And I think every individual should think more positive than they think now. And there's something about being positive because it affects your character, your nature, and uh, your demeanor, your your psyche even, <clears throat> and you should think positive, but your positive should be based on someone that exists, someone that's real, someone that's tangible. Look, Buddha, I'm praying to you uh, in the name of Buddha. Buddha's dead. He's in the grave. His ashes are spread who knows where. He's not alive anymore. He's not sitting anywhere helping us. You know, So praying in his name is, is not going to help. Joseph Smith, he's dead. Rutherford, he's dead. These guys are all dead. Confucius, dead. They're all dead. Pray in the name of Jesus. He's alive. Over 500 people saw him resurrect from the dead. And he said, I'm ascending. And the disciples saw him ascend into the heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, which he's going to make intercession for us daily. Now there's power. Amen. There's authority. Who, the person who created the heavens and the earth, who spoke it into existence. So if you're going to pray, pray in his name. And if you're going to pray for me, pray from him and not from good vibes. Because that's not going to help me at all. You know. Now I don't mean to offend you. But if you think about this logically, it makes sense. 
I might as well be praying from the chairs. The chairs bless you, you know, somehow. The chair's not going to bless me. So pray in the name, and that's what Paul is doing. In the name of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to God always for you, <clears throat> all making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience uh, of hope in the Lord Jesus, in the sight of God our Father. Uh, Paul encouraged them by saying thank you for being faithful. Thank you for serving the Lord. Thank you for helping the kingdom of God. That's something I don't do a whole lot of. And I know it's from my upbringing. Pastor Chuck has always taught us that, um, that we shouldn't desire to receive thanks because then that's a reward. And we do things from wanting thanks from someone else or accolades. Then we're working for someone else and not for God. And so we want to hear that voice, right? Well done, good and faithful servant. But unfortunately, uh, that has caused me to go the other way too. And sometimes it seems like I'm not, appreci I'm not appreciative of what people do, but I really am because I can't do it without him. I can't do what Randy did here, and I couldn't do it without him. And yet I, I, I have never really told him thanks, you know, really from my heart <clears throat> and let him know that. And it was interesting this week, and he's probably listening right now, but um, we were just sharing in a, 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 a private moment, and it was very personal and intimate with each other as he shared his heart with me some some little he goes and these are just little thoughts that just come into my head and and as he's sharing this and i'm like wow randy you do have feelings too <laughs> you're a person too oh there he is over there i didn't even see him <laughs> i'm not going to tell you what he said you know but it, you know what it opened my eyes because it's like I, I take him for granted i take him for granted you know i was sitting there in the conference and and all of a sudden, he's like, hey, you know, I think I said to him, I go, hey, is there water out there? He jumped up and he was gone. And I'm like, I, I didn't even have to ask. I just asked, is there water? All of a sudden, he comes back with a bottle of water, you know? And I'm just like, wow, I felt like David and his mighty men, you know? And I felt like I shouldn't even drink it, you know? I said, no, you have it, Randy. But I drank it all up. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the kind of guy that, that he is and... And the Lord just opened up my eyes that I have someone on my, my side that's fighting with me, like Salvinus and Timothy, you know, that's faithful there. And yet he still had some of these concerns, you know, which showed me that I need to be more appreciative of people. <clears throat> Knowing, beloved brethren, verse 4, your election by God. Uh, for our gospel uh, did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Now, Paul's talking about himself and, and, and uh, Salvanus and Timothy and probably others, uh, that they were faithful men to the Lord and their character and integrity showed it, uh, which is so important for all of us to have character integrity. And if we say we're going to do something, that we do it because then we can trust you to do so. Uh, you became fellow, or you became followers of us and of the Lord, uh, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believed. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Wow, that's pretty good, huh? I mean, he uses the word sounded for. That's like a military term, right? You guys sounded for like, like, like men in a battle, lining up with spear in hand and shields on their left, marching together, sounding forth with the trumpets blowing, battling against the enemy. That's what he's making it sound. You went forth, you know, uh, with the gospel. Uh, you went forward with it, as he says here. Uh, very clearly, um, so much so that we started to share, and they're like, oh yeah, we heard that from the Thessalonians, oh, okay, let's move on, hey, what about you guys, you hear about, G yeah, we heard that also, wow, we didn't even have to say much when we got here, because it already was spreading, you know, um, and by the way, that's how the church functions, guys, the church doesn't grow because the pastor goes out and, and gets people, it grows by you, the church. The church is the size it is is because the people are sitting in the church. Think about that for a little bit. See, a shepherd does not beget sheep. What begets sheep? What births sheep? 
sheep. Sheep. <laughs> sheep can only birth sheep. Shepherds don't birth sheep. And so you want more sheep, you want more people, then it's up to the church to get excited about Jesus and what Jesus is doing in their lives and share the gospel and invite them to church. It, you can't say that's the pastor's responsibility because it's not. It is the church. That's on you. I am to be faithful with teaching the word and equipping the sheep for the work of the ministry. That's my job. And your job is to get more sheep to come in. Yeah, we put on events. Yeah, I, I pray and I ask God to lead us, to guide us so we can somehow reach out. But even in that reaching out, I can't do it all. You guys are out there with us, enjoying the music, enjoying the festival, enjoying whatever concert we're having. And you should be mingling with people and getting them to come to church. I can't do that. Sheep beget sheep. And that's what Paul is saying here. Boy, you guys are doing your job. I come in and share and they're like, you, they already knew about the gospel. And that's the way it should work. Verse 8. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. Verse 9. For they themselves declared concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living true God. That's their testimony right there. If anything, share your testimony. You know, I don't know the doctrines of Jesus. I, I know he's God. I, you can't, I can't point to you in what scripture and so forth. But I'll tell you this. This I know that I was a wretched sinner at one time. And I did some bad things and God forgave me and he changed my life. And now I'm not my own, I'm Jesus's. And he has put me on solid ground. He's taken drugs away from me. He's you know, done this or that. And now I'm in church and I met the good people and the fellowshipping and life seems to be a lot better. And I really find people that are loving and really caring and it's like, wow, that's what I want. And so you can share that testimony with people because that's not what they have. You know, most people in the world are going through trials and struggles just like you are. And they're looking for someone to come along and say, hey, I've got an answer. Really? What is it? Jesus. And they might go, oh, Jesus. Okay. No, I'm serious. It is Jesus. I've given my life to him and he has been faithful. And if they see that sincerely in you, they're like, I gotta try this Jesus and see what he's all about. Let's close up. So they changed from idols to serve the true and living God, verse 10, and to wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from what? From the yeah. wrath to come, or gay, the wrath of God, the wrath of the Lamb of God, uh, Revelation says, the wrath of the Almighty that's coming upon the world. And yet here Paul said that your testimony is, is that God has saved you from the wrath of the Almighty to come upon you. And that's what Jesus wants to do, save us from the wrath of God. Is God angry at the world? No, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. He went on to tell Nicodemus, or before that, he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. You must be born from above. In other words, your old life has to change. You now have to desire to be in church. You know, there's a desire to be in church. I don't know if you have that desire to be in church. Maybe you don't have that desire. But I feel like, I feel like I'm missing something if I don't go to church Amen. on Sunday morning. And that's because I'm born from above. You know, I don't know if you ever felt like that. You ever, you ever leave your house and you go, I'm missing something. What is it? I just know it. I just know it. And you get in your car and you go to put your keys and you're like, oh, my keys. <laughs> and you just know it. And so you got to get out of your car. You got to go back and you got to get your keys, you know. And then you get in the car, you start your car and you're like, wait a minute, where's my church, key, church keys? Oh, and you got to get out. You just know something's not right. Something's missing when I miss church. There's a change that took place in your life. And you know the importance of church, and you'll do whatever it takes to go to church. I remember a young man who worked for uh, Budweiser uh, years ago, and I remember that we had some conversations like that because he would work on Sundays delivering Budweiser. But he had this conviction like, I don't feel good delivering Budweiser. I don't feel that it's right, you know, and, and so forth. And I says, well, pray about it. Maybe the Lord has another job for you. And sure enough, it just didn't feel right, and he ended up quitting and finding another job. You know, have people talk about wanting to be at church, wanting and hungering to be at church and fellowshipping with the brethren, just like the Bible says to, you know, and they'll quit their work or they'll let them know, I'm off on Sundays, I'm sorry. If you want to fire me, fine, but I'm off, I'm dedicating that. And we've all heard the stories of the great Olympian, Olympian right, 
runner who said he's not running on the Sabbath day, you know, and so he ended up giving up a gold medal. He would have had the gold medal. We heard of the, the woman recently, the soccer player, you know, who stood her ground that would not wear the, the, uh, the, the, the gay and lesbian colors and say, no, I don't agree with that. I'm standing my ground. And they kicked her out of the team, but she was willing to sacrifice. And that's what happens when you're born from above because you're born again. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I hope that you will receive Jesus into your heart and that you will have your desires changed. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for your grace and your mercy and your love, Lord. And I do pray, Father, that whoever's listening right now, that they would simply receive Jesus into their heart by saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I have many sins that I have committed now and in the past, and I want you to wash them away. And I desire not to do them any longer, Lord, and I know that I need your help, your strength, in order to have victory over my sins. And Lord, when you come into my life, Lord, cause me to be born again, Father, born from above, that, Lord, I may surrender everything to you now and truly repent and turn from my old ways and walk in a new way, Lord. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that, please let us know. Just put a little post there and say, hey, I received Jesus into my heart so that we can pray for you. And if you need any prayers, please post them or private message me and we'll pray for you. We're here at the church right now with a good 10 or 12 people here or so. And um, we're going to pray for you right now. So God bless you. We'll see you on Monday as we look at chapter 2 of Thessalonians. Have a wonderful day.